I'm here with Christophe barrier Vajou. Now, Christophe's an expat Frenchman, been living in Australia for 15 years, and is one of Australia's best exponents of the Dakar Rally. Welcome to our show, Christophe. Thank you. I'd like to know how you got into motorcycling in the first place. Now, you grew up in West Africa. That's correct, yeah, in the Ivory Coast. Okay, now, now, how did you end up there in the first place? It was one of those times where I was in France and um, I received a phone call from my dad that was still in the Ivory Coast and he said, Christophe, before you come into the country, make yourself, um, get yourself a helmet. And I was like, a helmet? That means a motorcycle. So I was very, very happy. Yeah. And uh, I started riding on a, on a small MT-50 Honda a motorbike for about two months, learning how to shift gears and jumping. Yep. And then I got straight into motocross after that. Yeah, I was 15. So the Ivory Coast has got a, a reasonably big French expat population? That's correct, yeah. yeah. It used to be a French colony and uh, there's about 80 or so thousand people at the time that was, uh, they were French uh, citizens. Yeah. So what was the motorcycle scene there like? I mean, you wouldn't imagine it would be very big, but... It was not very big, but uh, it, was, uh, it had a good level. Um, and uh, when I started, there was not too many riders, but then the, the racing uh, picked up. And um, just to, uh, to give you an idea, back in uh, 1990, um, we had the West African Motocross Nation, that race that gathered the best riders of all around West Africa. And um, I won this race as a team five years in a row. And in 1990, we had 220,000 spectators around the two and a half kilometer track. That's how wow. big it was. That's impressive, isn't yeah. it? Well, obviously the Dakar Rally, or as it was known, Paris Dakar, is huge in France. It's actually run by a French company. That's correct. That yes. right? So, how did you get in, interested in the Paris Dakar? What, what was there a point where you uh, just become on your radar? Well, not really. Obviously, the Dakar in the Ivory Coast is pretty big. Not so much of Thierry Sabine, but because the actual creator of, of uh, Rally Red was from the Ivory Coast and he was not Thierry Sabine. His name was Jean-Claude Bertrand. And um, the Dakar in the Ivory Coast has always been you know, uh, known because of Jean-Claude. Uh, Thierry Sabine took it over in early 1979. But uh, what triggered it for me is 1986 uh, when Thierry Sabine crashed in, in the helicopter and, um, and Hubert Oriol was racing on the Kajiva team. 1986, our friend that sold me our first motocross bike uh, came into town with this big, massive Kajiva elephant. I mean, that bike was huge. Like the seat was like a meter and a half tall. It was massive. And um, he had a Bell 4 helmet, which said to me, look, Christophe, I cannot wear the helmet. It's too tight for me. Uh, do you want to have it? And by the way, it's, it belongs to Uber Oriol. And I was like, whoa, this is really good. So, mm -hmm. And that was my first uh, experience with the Dakar bike. And when I looked at the bike and I looked at the speeds that they were going to, not knowing where they were going, I said, this is crazy. This is definitely not for me. Yeah. I mean, a lot different to going around a motocross track where, That's sure, right, yeah. the corners change you know, because of the, the surface every lap, but still, at the end of the day, you know where you're going. So you must have had a point in time where you went from thinking, this is not for me, to this is for me, and not really knowing that it was probably going to dominate the rest of your life. That's correct, yeah, I had no idea. Uh, obviously, motocross was my passion, then supercross, then racing in, in Southern California as well. And to me, the, uh, the precision of, uh, of the technique uh, on riding a motorbike was, was paramount. And um, I did a lot of that in Africa, in, in the US, and some in Australia as well. And uh, in 2004, I was kind of looking for next challenge, something else I could be doing. And um, just one day, like this, close to my birthday, I said, well, why not the Dakar rally? And that was it. It was just an instant decision. I said, okay, I'm going to do the Dakar rally. How? I had no idea. Mm. But I was going to do the Dakar rally. Let's um, take a look at that. Now, you've done two Dakars, or two Paris Dakars, and then two over on, uh, or, or in South America. That's right. So, were you already living in Australia when you started your first? Yes, I was, yeah. I, was, uh, I moved to Australia in 1999, so it was, uh, my first Dakar was in 2006. Yeah. So, why Australia? I mean, you obviously call Australia home now. That's I mean, right. You consider yeah. yourself an Australian. Yeah, I've got the Australian passport. Yeah. I've got the accent, mate. And, uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, wh why Australia? I mean, we, we, we love it, of course, but. Well, I grew up as a kid in the Ivory Coast, and uh, in Africa, you, I mean, you can do pretty much anything you want. So, it's, uh, it's very free, people are very friendly. And um, then I went to uh, and, and did my studies in Southern California, in San Diego. And after nine years of living in the U.S., I was kind of missing the European culture. I was missing the outdoors of Africa, and I was looking for, you know, another country that could give me what had dominated my youth, you know, as a kid. 
and I was looking for a country that had the uh, European culture, the, uh, the business side of the US and, uh, and the uh, outdoors of Africa. Plus, I always wanted to live on an island, so I picked Australia. Ooh, cool. It's a big island. But. Yeah, it's a big island. <laughs> so to go and do your initial Dakar in 2006, yes. from Australia, what bike did you choose? Uh, well, at the time, it was the, uh, the KTM uh, 660. Uh, that was the bike that was purposefully built for the Dakar Rally and uh, the most reliable and so that's, that's what I picked. Yeah, it was a massive bike compared to what I, I used to ride. So. And the buying one in Australia, that's not so easily done, is it? No, you don't buy one in Australia, period. So yeah, I had to buy it from overseas, from the factory in, in Austria, from KTM in Austria. And what sort of money was it to buy, I mean, this purpose-built yep. purpose bike? Uh, that bike at the time was... I think 14,000 euro uh, in 2006 or 2005, and that cost about $25,000 or so. Okay. And so it was already over there for you. What does it cost to actually enter a Dakar Rally? Everything from bike, entry fees, logistic, um, gears, you know, planes, you know, everything is about $100,000, $120,000 if you want to do it with the mechanic. Wow. So, so it's a lot of money, yes. It's a lot of money. And your initial Dakar, tell us how that went. That lasted three days. <laughs> and then 20,000 divided by three, that's $40,000 a day. A crash? Yeah, a big crash, yeah, yeah. Or multiple crashes. Um, first crash um, on, on the bike, I just want to qualify this. On the bike, you had the, the trip master, and, um, and the first days in Portugal, we didn't really use the, the road book reading or anything. And, uh, but when we got into Portugal, I noticed there was a bit misalignment between what the road book was saying and where I was. And I thought it was my first Dakar, I said, maybe I have to learn a few things, maybe I'm not doing the right thing. But uh, I saw this danger come up and the road book says another 400 meters before I was getting close to it. And I put my head up and it was right in front of me. So I had this massive uh, crash about 120 kilometers an hour. I flew about 20 meters up in the air, uh, hit a massive ditch and um, broke my nose, dislocated my shoulder, hurt my kidney and my knee. And uh, and then I heard a voice come. And I looked up in the sky and said, that's it, God does exist. <laughs> I was in the middle of nowhere. And then I realized uh, it was the, uh, the equipment that we have on the bike. It was actually the uh, organization in Paris asking me if I was all right. Wow. And I said, yeah, I'm OK. The, uh, the shoulder is out, uh, but I'm OK. It's just the shoulder being dislocated. And I said, don't move. We'll send you a helicopter. I said, no, this is not possible. I saved so much money. I trained so hard, three days. I'm not stopping now. And I remember, you know, growing up as a, as a kid, you know, the, the movie is about Australia. It's Crocodile Dundee and Mel Gibson. Yeah. And Mel Gibson, you know that shoulder? So yeah. I pulled and I pushed and I pulled and I pushed. And after 20 minutes, I managed to reinsert the shoulder into the socket. I called the, uh, the organization back. I said, forget it. You know, your chopper is late anyway. I'm going again. And the bike went from brand new, not a single scratch, to everything was bent. Um, took off again, thinking, well, it's going to hurt. Another you know, 11 days of racing is going to be painful. Um, and then I stopped about 200 kilometers later to refuel. And uh, we went from a bike being 160 kilos to a bike that was refueled with 48 liters of fuel to 215 kilos. And um, 15 minutes later into the boulder rocks, my shoulder was a bit weak, couldn't breathe properly. And uh, I fell into boulder rocks and broke three ribs. So somebody helped me get on the bike because suddenly I couldn't twist anymore. Got back on the bike and rode 220 kilometers like that. Not able to sit or stand up with tears that big into my eyes from the pain and said, look, if, I'm, if I don't finish Dakar, I'm going to at least finish today. That was my first introduction to the Dakar rally. Wow. Now, obviously, you've kept going back, a little bit of unfinished business and uh, so, the last time you raced in the Dakar on a solo is what Dream Race is all about. That's right, yeah. So what year was that? That was 2010. So okay. 2009, I had a, um, obviously I finished the Dakar in 2007 in Africa, across the finish line at the Lac Rose. 2008, the Dakar was cancelled. 2009, I had a freak accident at five kilometers an hour, still sitting on a motorbike, broke my arm. That should not have happened. And so I didn't want to finish the Dakar on a motorbike on a bad note. So I said, look, um, I need to go back finished completely what I started. Um, 
and, um, and we're going to try to make a film out of this uh, to show how, what it takes to, to do the Dakar rally, to all the effort and the sacrifices. Uh, people don't realize, they think you just put a throw, you know, throw a bunch of money and everything is easy. It's not, uh, especially from Australia. So it's a time difference and dealing with Europe and all of that is, is difficult. So I wanted to record all of this. Obviously, no script. We had no idea what the story was going to, to be like. And I ran out of cash and didn't have enough money. So I had to do it the, the good old ways, working on the bike by myself, no mechanics. So it was tougher than, you tough. know. Yeah, that's right. So not only was it tough to actually do the event, filming the, the documentary had its own challenges, I that's guess. That's correct, yeah. Uh, so we, um, I had a, a filmmaker, um, Simon Lee, that uh, documented the event. It was the first Dakar for him. Um, and even for him, it was difficult because we didn't have a massive crew. It was not the Charlie Bowman, you know, with a massive team behind it. It was just the cameraman and his camera, and that was it. And plus me on the bike and holding the, uh, having the helmet camera. So we filmed all of this, and uh, what we, uh, the story turned out to be is a massive, massive, um, almost uh, life-changing uh, story that people can relate to. And it's not about the Dakar Rally, it's not about uh, doing the most dangerous race on the planet, it's really about yourself and how far you're willing to push your limits. And this is why the film has been so acclaimed internationally. We won so many awards, four awards, seven nominations, and it's the first time in the 35-year history that a film about the Dakar Rally won any, won any award. Okay. Wow, that's and impressive. And this is Dream Racer, yeah. Yeah. Now, you intend to go back to race in the Dakar yes. again, but it's not going to be on two wheels this time. It's going to be on four. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Two wheels became too easy now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So we're going to try something else. Um, it's going to be a, a single-seater buggy. And no co-pilot, so I'm, I'm used to doing the navigation. So that has its own set of challenges, especially mm -hmm. when you get stuck in sand dunes or if you need to get extracted from the car in case of an accident. So there's a danger, dangerous part of it. But I'm going to try to do something that no one has attempted to do in all the history of the Dakar, is to do it without any mechanical assistance. So I'll be working on the car every day myself. Okay. So I'm not sure if I can do it. I'll figure out the different details a bit later. But uh, it's going to be uh, um, time management is going to be the massive, massive issue for me. And when's the goal? What year? 2016, January 2016. The 12 months? Yes. We're just over. <laughs> it will go very, very fast. Yeah, well, good luck with it. Thank you. I first saw Dream Racer, the film Dream Racer, on a plane heading to America. And I liked it that much that we decided to stock it here at Cycle Talk. So you can buy it from us. But more importantly, what Dream Racer does. I think is give people the hope to live their own dreams and everyone's dreams different I've got my own dreams Christoph's lived his dreams with the Dakar rally but it doesn't matter what your dream is you watch this and I'm telling you it will empower you to get off your backside and get out there and do what you want to do because that's what it's all about I've been waiting to make this film for most of my adult life. And every day you're getting closer to your death. And at first I think it's a joke. I mean, here's this guy, he's a business consultant. He doesn't look particularly fit and he's planning to take part in the Dakar rally. It's like you're breathing out and you just go, here we go, here we go, this is it. This is the start of the Dakar Rally. He's never ridden that bike, so he's going to get on this bike that he's never ridden to then undertake a 10,000 kilometer race across some of the harshest terrain in the world. We've got a bloody amazing story. Body just wants to keep on moving forward, and the mind is no longer driving the body, the body is driving the mind. The race is just the vehicle, it's all the things that you go through all year long trying to beat the time. The time is not stopping. It's hell here, this is just hell. Three days of riding a motorbike on extremely rough terrain without the use of one of your arms. I've never suffered in my entire life like this. 
He was 36, you know, how can, how can this happen? He just died. So I'm going to take him with me. He's going to be my co-pilot. If you don't go and have to chase your dreams, you don't know what's going to happen the next day. You, you really don't know. From the string, you hang on to it. You hang on to it. Even if the string starts ripping apart and you start falling off, you just hang on to it. Just make things happen. No matter what, you just come to it. What is it that you have done in your life that makes you say, yes, I'm happy having had such a life? The Dream Racer DVD is available from motobooks.com.au or call the Cycle Talk office on 02-4956-9820 and it's priced at $24.95.